Asteroids aren't as rare on our planet as we may think. About 17,000 of them visit us every year. You've probably seen at least one in your life, for example, if you've seen a shooting star. They leave these bright tails behind them as they pass through Earth's atmosphere. Of course, they only look beautiful in the sky. If they reach the ground, the consequences would be catastrophic. Luckily for us, most of them explode 30 to 50 miles above the surface. Their mass is too small for them to withstand such a journey to the end, so most of them remain harmless to us. But we shouldn't underestimate them. Let's start with the smallest ones. One to three foot high asteroids are about the size of a person. They're too small to cause any real damage. Most often, they explode in the atmosphere without even reaching its lower layers. But at the same time, they splash up tons of energy over the surface every time. 13 to 15 foot asteroids the height of giraffes and mammoths. These larger meteorites come to us less often, once a year and a half. Like the previous ones, they, fortunately, don't pose a serious threat, but they splash out much more energy. 30 feet, the height of a three to four story building. They visit us once every 10 years, and now we're talking seriously. It throws out a wave that could demolish an entire city. I think you understand how catastrophic the consequences would be if this asteroid touched Earth. 65 feet, multi-story building. They like to visit Earth once every 60 to 70 years. Good news, it explodes at 12 miles above the ground. Its released energy could destroy an entire region if it touched the ground. Bad news, such an asteroid has already visited us recently, and the consequences were pretty rough. It all happened in a city called Chelyabinsk. On February 15, 2013, at about 9.20 a.m. local time, the giant slowed down in the Earth's atmosphere and then broke up into small pieces at 14.5 miles above the Earth. These pieces then flew in different directions. It shattered the windows all over the city and damaged many buildings, including people's houses, schools, and others. It took a while to repair everything, and the scale of this destruction was quite serious. As a result, there were 1,615 injured. But fortunately, no casualties. At least we're safe for the time being. The next such asteroid may come to us only in the 2070s or 80s, and no one knows where exactly it wants to land. Now let's move on. 300 feet. This is the height of the Statue of Liberty together with the pedestal. Such a giant can be seen every 4,500 years. And this is the first asteroid on our list that may literally crash into Earth. The consequences are disastrous. Not only may it demolish an entire city, but it can also set fire to neighboring areas. Well, some people even witness such a meteorite land on our planet. The notorious Tunguska meteorite is the biggest asteroid disaster that people have ever seen. It all happened on June 30th, 1908 in eastern Siberia. The meteorite was bright, like a second sun, and people felt the heat wave when it just approached the Earth. It exploded near the river. Fortunately, the whole area was surrounded by taiga, and there were no big cities nearby. But even there, it immediately destroyed a lot of trees. Serious forest fires broke out. The sound of the explosion was heard by people hundreds of miles around. At tens of miles around, all the house's windows broke. The magnetic storm that resulted from this collision lasted five hours. The consequences were truly disastrous, but perhaps this is not the worst thing that awaits humankind. 99942 Apophis, 1,215 feet. It's slightly bigger than the Eiffel Tower. This meteorite, as scientists discovered in 2013, will be our next guest. Collisions of such force occur in about 100,000 years, and this one is gradually approaching. The force of such an explosion is equal to the force of the catastrophic eruption of the Krakatoa volcano in 1883. This eruption is considered one of the most destructive in history. It caused a terrible tsunami. 165 cities and settlements were completely destroyed, and another 132 were seriously damaged. People all around the globe could feel the consequences of this eruption, at least to some degree. Such an asteroid could leave a 3.5-mile crater, and this is one we'll face in the distant future. But calm down, no need to panic yet. By 2070, the meteorite will be almost 174 million miles away from us. It still has a very long journey ahead of it, so we're safe for at least 100 years, or even more. Besides, our planet has survived something even worse. 
3,280 feet. This is higher than the tallest tower in the world, the Dubai Burj Khalifa Tower. Such collisions occur once every 500,000 years. We're not sure when such a collision occurred the last time. 70% of our planet is covered with water. If such meteorites fell into the ocean, it would be extremely difficult to find their traces. But we can assume the possible consequences. The wave would have swept across the entire hemisphere. The crater would be about 9 miles in diameter, and that would be a complete disaster. The last event of such a force happened 26 to 28 million years ago. It was an eruption of the supervolcano La Garita, which is located in the southwest of Colorado, USA. It was one of the most powerful known supervolcanic phenomena in history. During this monstrous eruption, a significant part of the current state of Colorado was destroyed. Scientists are still not sure how far the ashes have spread, but there was an even bigger meteorite in the history of mankind. The consequences of that impact were irreversible for an entire species of animals. I think you know what I'm talking about. Chichla meteorite, the thing that wiped the dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. This happened about 66 million years ago. These collisions in general happen about every 500 million years. The height of the Chichilub meteorite was 12.4 miles. It's so high that when it touched the ground, it could reach the stratosphere. Even looking at the 124-mile diameter crater left by this meteorite, you can understand how huge it was. When it collided with the Earth, millions of tons of energy were released. This is an unimaginable disaster. It fell at a very steep angle, creating a giant cloud of dust and chemicals that spread around the world. This dust had a very thin layer, but also a mass of 50 trillion tons. The shockwave swept across the entire planet. It caused several earthquakes. Volcanoes began to erupt actively. Forest fires broke out everywhere, all over the world. The amount of soot and carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere is invaluable. The Earth was closed from the sun for several days. Darkness reigned all over the planet. Planets couldn't produce enough oxygen, so there was nothing to breathe. The temperature on the continents and in the oceans dropped by an average of 50 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Sounds horrific, doesn't it? And, of course, it caused one of the greatest extinctions in the history of the Earth's biosphere. Amazingly, the Earth was able to recover after such a catastrophe. This event became the boundary between the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic eras. So now, those who wondered, how could a small meteorite destroy all the dinosaurs? Probably understand the answer. Perhaps the largest collision in the history of our entire planet was not a collision with a meteorite, but with an entire planet. This happened many, many billions of years ago. Theia, as this hypothetical dwarf planet was called, crashed into our Earth, releasing an incommensurable amount of energy, just quadrillions of fuel. The Earth then instantly turned into a giant fire, and it was this collision that led to the creation of the Moon. All that sounds terrifying, I know. So let's just hope that you and I will never see anything like this. We're flying past the planets of our solar system. We pass by Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Then we move through dark space beyond the edge of our world. We've reached our destination. It's the Oort Cloud. It's a hypothetical region around the solar system that holds tons of asteroids and blocks of ice. It's likely to be where the largest comet in human history was born. And now, it's heading toward the sun. Bernardinelli Bernstein was discovered totally by accident during the Dark Energy Survey. Our telescopes were pointed at distant space. Their main goal was to learn more about how the universe was expanding. Astronomers also wanted to make a more detailed map of the observable universe. Scientists analyzed over 80,000 images and found a moving object. It was alarmingly close to our home planet. Its size was an impressive 62 miles. That's about the width of Lake Michigan. It was an already active comet with a long tail. Usually, comets get a tail when they come close to the sun. The heat from the star warms the comet's surface, and light materials, like ice, begin to evaporate. This forms a cloud of steam and dust that stretches far beyond the comet. But Bernardinelli Bernstein is too far away from the sun to start heating up. This means that its surface has a different composition. 
It might be solid carbon monoxide. This increases the luminosity of the comet. That's why it can be observed with telescopes on Earth. We can compare Bernard and Ellie Bernstein to the largest meteorite to ever fall on Earth. About 66 million years ago, our planet was hit by a meteorite about six miles wide. At that time, the blast wave from the collision went around Earth several times. Tsunami waves caused by the impact were taller than the largest skyscrapers, and the energy from the explosion set huge areas on fire. Almost all living creatures, including dinosaurs and ancient fish, ceased to exist. The meteorite left a crater three times the size of Manhattan. The place where it fell was rich in sulfur. This substance evaporated because of the abnormal heat and gathered into massive clouds. This caused acid rains that were falling on Earth for several more weeks. Our newly discovered comet is 10 times bigger. If it were flying toward Earth, you'd see it with the unaided eye long before the impact. It looked like a moving star in the night sky. A few days before the comet reached our planet, you'd see it even during the day. You'd be able to distinguish its long tail, too. When the comet entered the atmosphere, it produced a booming sound so loud you'd hear it on the other side of Earth. At this point, the comet would begin to heat up because of friction with the air. It'd start burning. Countless pieces of debris would break away from the main body of the meteorite and fall to Earth. As soon as Bernardinelli Bernstein touched the surface of the planet, we'd see a flash so bright it'd outshine the sun. In a fraction of a second, a colossal amount of energy would be converted into heat. This would create the most powerful explosion in the history of our planet. It'd literally rip out chunks of ground and throw them into the air. The blast wave would incinerate everything within a few hundred miles. It continued to spread in different directions, breaking and bending trees. At one point, it reached snow-capped mountains and trigger huge avalanches that would cover many villages. The blast wave would go around the planet, shattering glass and buildings on all continents. Tsunami waves would be so high they would cover entire coastal cities. The most powerful earthquake in history would break the ground and create deep cracks. After the impact, billions of tons of dust and ash would rise into the air. A giant black cloud would completely block the sun's rays. Earth would be plunged into darkness. All the debris in the air would start melting. They'd turn into liquid lava and fall back to the surface, causing even more damage. The ash and dust in the air would cover the sun for several more months. During this time, the temperature on Earth would drop by several degrees. Even if they were hiding in deep shelters and bunkers, people, as well as all other living organisms on the planet, would be unlikely to survive this event. Fortunately, Bernardinelli Bernstein isn't going to approach Earth. Right now, the comet is about 20 astronomical units away from the Sun. That's 20 times the distance from Earth to the Sun. It means the comet will soon cross the orbit of Uranus. In 2031, it'll be 11 astronomical units away from our star. That's just outside Saturn's orbit. This is going to be the closest Bernardinelli Bernstein will approach the Sun. Then it will begin its flight back to the edge of the solar system. But the comet is bound to return again. It'll move away from the Sun and slow down until the star's gravity pulls it back. Then the comet will make another circle around our solar system. But that will take about 3 million years. Right now, we have other meteorites to worry about. For example, 3200 Phaedon. It crosses the orbits of Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury. Then it goes around the Sun and comes back. This cycle takes about 523 days. Then it starts over again. This meteorite is considered potentially hazardous because it crosses Earth's orbit at 7.5 Earth-Moon distances. During one of its last approaches to Earth, this 3.6-mile-wide block of rock showered our planet with small meteors. Since the asteroid often passes by the Sun, its surface is most likely to look like the dry bottom of a mud swamp. It's covered in scales and cracks. As it flies past Earth, these scales break off and cause meteor showers. But the largest, potentially hazardous asteroid is the 1999 JM8. It's about the size of 77 soccer fields. It passes by Earth at nine lunar distances. Its closest approach to our planet will happen in August 2137. If such a meteorite were to hit Earth, 
an entire continent could be wiped out. The rest of the world would experience massive tsunamis, but would survive the event. So naturally, scientists are thinking of ways to protect the planet from such a disaster. The first solution is a controlled Big Bang. One of the laws of physics says that if you apply some force in one direction, it'll cause a reaction in the opposite direction. So if we spot an asteroid that is about to collide with Earth, we'll need to send a rocket toward it. This way, we'll produce a controlled explosion, not inside, but right above its surface. The blast will be directed upward, and the asteroid will shift downward. Even this tiny shift would be enough to change the trajectory of the asteroid, and then it'll fly past Earth. Another way is to send a heavy object, like a spaceship, toward the space body. Every heavy object has its own gravity, so the spacecraft will have to fly close to the asteroid, which will attract the ship to its surface, but the engines of the spacecraft will resist. The ship will start pulling the asteroid in the opposite direction. This will change the trajectory of the asteroid, and our planet will remain intact. We can also ram the asteroid with the spaceship. Bam! Or, we could build a space station, like the ISS. It would be equipped with a bunch of huge magnifying lenses. We would send the station closer to the sun and start looking for potentially hazardous asteroids. Then, we'd point all the lenses so that the sun's rays would focus on the giant rock. The heat would begin to vaporize the matter from the asteroid's surface. That's where physics would come into play again. The matter would evaporate upward, and the asteroid would move downward. We could also wrap the asteroid in a reflective film, something like foil. Usually, space bodies absorb most of the sun's rays, but if the asteroid was covered in foil, the rays would bounce off its surface. This would create a weak pushing force. That should be enough to avoid the collision. Of course, we could attach rocket engines to the asteroid. This way, we would be able to not only change its trajectory, but also control it but that would depend on the size of the asteroid and the number of engines. And then, we could use this massive rock to ram it into other, larger asteroids. Our sun is an average-sized star, and still, it could fit 1,300,000 Earths. The star is also 333,000 times as heavy as our planet. NASA has translated radio waves created by planets' atmospheres into audible sounds. That's how astronomers found out that Neptune sounds like ocean waves. Jupiter, like being underwater. And Saturn's voice resembles background music to a horror movie. Here on Earth, it's bebop jazz. Now I made that up. The sun's surface is scorching hot, but a bolt of lightning is five times hotter. Earth gets struck by 100 lightning bolts every second, which results in 8 million lightning strikes a day and around 3 billion a year. Ooh, shocking! If you manage to go to the moon one day and see fresh footprints, that doesn't mean there's someone else there with you. Footprints or similar marks can last for a million years over there. Because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There are no winds, not even a breeze, that can slowly erase those footprints. Astronomers have found the largest hole we've ever seen in the universe. It's the giant void that spreads a billion light years across. They found it accidentally. One of the research team members was a little bored and wanted to check how things are going in the direction of the cold spot. That's an anomaly in the Cosmic Microwave Background Map, or CMB for short. It's a faint glow of light that falls on our planet from different directions and fills the universe. It's been streaming through space for almost 14 billion years as the afterglow that occurred after the Big Bang. So you fall right into the heart of the black hole and prepare for a sad end. Well, you don't have to. Falling into a black hole won't necessarily destroy you or your spaceship. You have to choose a bigger black hole to survive. If you fall into a small black hole, its event horizon is too narrow, and the gravity increases every inch down. So if you extend your arm forward, the gravity on your fingers is much stronger than on your elbow. This will make your hand lengthen, and you'll feel some… discomfort. Rather significant, to be honest. Things change if you fall into a supermassive black hole, like the ones in the center of galaxies. 
they can be millions of times heavier than the Sun. Their event horizon is wide, and the gravity doesn't change as quickly. So, the force you'll feel at your heels and at the top of your head will be about the same. And you can go all the way to the heart of the black hole. This myth is busted. If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around the eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry, so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, that's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen. And since there's not any in space, well… Once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow has survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP40-365. It's a partially burnt white dwarf. A white dwarf is a star that burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. If you ever go into space, don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. <laughs> Small comfort. When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. This happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction, but at the same time, squeeze it into another, like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like for a billion suns, but luckily, it's far away from us. If you made a big boom on an asteroid, you'd never be able to hear its loud sound. Yes, we often hear the sound of spaceships and battles in space in the movies, but that's just a myth. Sound is a wave that spreads because of the vibrations of molecules. A person claps a few feet away from you, the sound wave begins to push the first air molecule next to the clap, then the second, third, and so on, until the wave reaches your ear. So, to spread sound, we need molecules like air or water. In our atmosphere, sound waves spread out just fine. But space is a vacuum, so it's nothing here. You can clap your hands loudly there, but there just won't be any molecules that can vibrate and carry that sound. So, to carry on a conversation, you'd either need a radio or really good lip-reading skills. Meteoroids orbit the sun while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world from satellites to rocket ships. Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. And there's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the other 70% of the universe. Hmm, that adds up to 100, right? Now, let's look at the moon. It always looks at us with one side. This means the moon has a dark side, and the sun's rays never get there. Well, that's a myth. The whole point is that the moon is gravitationally locked to the Earth. There are days and nights there, too. It's just that this rotation is perfectly aligned with the rotation of the Earth. So whenever you look at the moon, you only see one side. Although there are days when the sun shines there, too, so it's not the dark side, it's the far side. And we even have pictures of this place. And there's one of the biggest craters in our entire solar system. The South Pole Aiken Basin is as wide as two states of Texas. Yeehaw! 
One myth that turned out to be untrue is that people have never actually been on the moon. This is the original spacesuit of the first astronauts who were there. Look at the sole of the shoe. Some people claim there's no way they could have left footprints like this there. Actually, they could. On the moon, the astronauts wore extra boots over their suits, and their soles matched the footprints on the moon perfectly. Now, the astronauts didn't need them when they left the moon and tossed them when the moonwalk was over. They left a lot of stuff there, too. They even tossed the armrests of the seats in the lunar module to reduce the weight. Now, counting all the Apollo lunar missions, the total weight of rubbish on the moon is approximately 187 tons, including several lunar rovers, spacecraft debris, six lunar modules, and all the experiments left behind. That's like three Boeing 737s. Another myth about the sun is that it's yellow. Let's send you into space for this one. You look out the window and it's white. The sun only appears yellow to us through the filter of our atmosphere. The composition of the air and its thickness just distorts the light of the star. But stars do come in different colors. Cooler stars have bright orange and red colors. These are usually very old stars, older than our sun. But young and very hot stars are bright blue. The sun is about in the middle of the spectrum. Oh, one more myth about asteroids. We need to fly a little farther than Mars's orbit. Whoa, we're in an asteroid belt. And we constantly have to dodge giant rocks and blocks of ice. We got in some dense asteroid clouds. Hmm, not true. The fact is that space is huge, and the distances are incredible. All the rocks and debris in the asteroid belt are only 4% of the weight of the moon. So there really aren't that many of them there. To understand the dimension of the emptiness in space, look at the collision of two galaxies. There are billions of stars in each of them. If we mix them up, it's unlikely there will be any collisions even here.